Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our online service. This week, we're celebrating the day of Pentecost. And we're going to talk this morning about the Holy Spirit and His work in our lives and our work through Him. So you may want to get your Bible out. We're going to look at a few different scriptures this morning. And... Um, we're just going to walk through. I'm going to start way back at the very beginning. So, my first scripture will be in Genesis chapter 2. And um, as we know what happens in the beginning, God created a beautiful paradise, the Garden of Eden, and placed within it a beautiful family. He said it is not good for man to be alone. He created Adam and Eve and gave them this beautiful garden to tend. And in Genesis 2, 15, the scripture says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. So he gave Adam a job to do in the very beginning. He gave him work to do. And if we read through the next chapter or so, we find out that this work was just a joy for Adam to be involved in. He loved being in the garden. Him and Eve had everything they could ever ask for. They had a wonderful and beautiful life there in the Garden of Eden. But in this garden, of course, you have the forbidden tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So, the knowledge of good and evil, as you read through the story of Scripture, and as Martin Luther said, you may be able to break Scripture down into really two words, the law and the gospel. The um, knowledge of good and evil is, in a word, the law. That's what God gives man, the Ten Commandments. That's what God gives the law for is so that man can understand the knowledge of good and evil. And in this garden, there is one tree that is forbidden for them to eat from. And all their work and all their play, they can't go to this tree that gives them the knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> so in Genesis 3, 17 through 19, and of course we know the story. The one thing they're not supposed to do, they do. And um, the serpent convinces Eve convinces Adam to eat from the tree. And because of this, there's a curse. There's a curse put on the serpent. There's a curse put on Eve. And there's a curse put on Adam. Now the curse on Eve, two curses enter in, Adam and Eve. Um, the curse on Eve is a curse that brings pain in childbirth or a curse that affects the family life of Eve and Adam. It affects their childbearing. It affects how family will work. And then there's a curse that comes to Adam. And then I'll read this in Genesis 3:17. To Adam he said, Because you listened to the voice of your wife, and you ate from the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it will bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So you have the curse on childbirth, or the pain of childbirth, and you have the curse on Adam's work. And we all know, of course, the effect of this curse. Uh, work 
is a four letter word, right? Work has become just a miserable thing for so many people. Um, there's a proclivity to laziness in the human race. You know, I've known many people who will go expend more energy just trying to get out of work than they would if they would just do it. But we have a tendency and a bent to look for an easy way out. We look for a path of least resistance in our lives. <clears throat> so this Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. The day we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. So, in Acts 2, I'll just read the um, few scriptures here about Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So as the Holy Spirit filled the church at the beginning, you know, there's these are contested, debated scriptures. Everybody has their own opinion on what that exactly means. They began to speak in other tongues. Is that something that happened one time or is it still happening today? But I think what everybody can agree on is that when they were all filled with the Holy Spirit they began to do something. They didn't stay seated, they didn't do nothing. They, When they were filled with the Holy Spirit they began to do something. The Holy Spirit put them to work. The Holy Spirit gave them something to do. Their lives became a miracle. In Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, the prayers. All came upon every soul, <clears throat> and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. They were working again in the manner that Adam worked in the garden. See, in Galatians, Chapter 3 and verse 13, the scripture says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. So Galatians is all about the difference between the law and the spirit. The law, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, puts us under a curse and makes our work misery. But the Spirit liberates us and makes our work full of joy. Now what is that work? Well in short, it's everything. Do everything that you do as unto the Lord. All of our work uh, throughout our whole lives has now been liberated to be joyful instead of miserable because of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And in more specific ways, it's the work of developing Christian character, of bringing about God's kingdom and justice on earth, the work of serving others, of raising our children in the ways of God, of loving our spouse, the work of loving God. That work has now been given to us as a gift, and it's been given to us by the Holy Spirit as a joy instead of a misery. So perhaps the great contribution of John Wesley and the Methodists um, after the Reformation was that emphasis on our work as Christians as guided by the Holy Spirit. Now John Wesley and the early Methodists were they were busy. They were doing something. They were they were going. They were uh, John Wesley was preaching all over the place all the time. He was, uh, they, they had a mission to do, and they didn't do it because they felt like they had to. They did it because they felt like God had given it to them as a blessing. All right.
So, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, we continue on um, after Paul says that the curse has been lifted and now we are set free in Christ and our work is no longer miserable but joyful. <clears throat> Paul tells us that there are works of the flesh. The works, notice that word, of the flesh. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. He goes on and on and on this list that the, the many vices and sins that we struggle with. But he says, the fruit of the Spirit. So he calls that that our flesh does works, but that that the Spirit does in us fruit. The fruit of the Spirit, he says, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against those things, there is no law. Remember the tree. Against those things, there is no law. But what's interesting to me is, in my experience, things like love, peace, especially things like patience, and self-control require a lot of work in our lives. And if we do them in our own strength, or by the law, then that work is miserable. We continually fail. We can never, in our own strength, muster the self-control we need to resist sin. Or we can never gain patience by our own work and strength. But, if by the Spirit we allow God to do this work in us, then this production of fruit in the garden of our lives can be filled with joy. Amen.
of the day at the warehouse. Let us pray. Father, thank you for walking with us during this troubling time. And thank you for all the many blessings that you bestowed on us during this time. All the times that you held us during our worry, comfort us during our sadness. And Father, just carry us and help lead us through uncertainty. We ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I just want to thank you for joining us for worship this morning. And I also want to thank you for uh, worshiping with us over the last few months as we tried these online services. Uh, we hope you have found them meaningful uh, during this time when you've been at home. I'm excited to announce that starting next Sunday, June the 7th at 930, we're going to be having a outdoor service uh, for probably the next month or so right here where I'm standing outside the warehouse. We're going to be doing a contemporary outside worship service at 930 on Sunday mornings. Uh, the warehouse worship band will be back with you leading some music. We're going to do a devotional type sermon. Uh, where we won't be having child care right off the bat, so we're hitting uh, a service of about 30 to 40 minutes. So please come and join us. Uh, you'll have two options. You can park outside uh, here at the warehouse and stay in your car, or you're more than welcome to bring blankets and chairs and, and sit outside as long as you socially distance. But we are so excited to give you this opportunity for worship. Uh, following that on every Sunday, if you're not comfortable coming to church yet or can't make it, uh, we're going to be also offering a traditional online service. So you'll have two options for worship starting next week, but we are very excited that one of those is a live service here at the warehouse. So please come join us next Sunday morning at 930, and thank you for all your support over the last months. God bless. Thank you.